we're going to talk about Chapter 20. Chapter 20 covers lymphatic system and what we, call, what we consider lymphoid organs and lymphoid tissues. Okay? Last time I kind of introduced this to you a little bit and I told you what the overall function of the lymphatic system is. What is the overall function of the lymphatic system? Ridding excess water from your body and it has an immune system function. Okay? The majority of the lymphatic system is just a collection of vessels. It's just tubes running through your body. The lymphoid organs are kind of hard to discuss because they don't really have to deal with just the lymphatic system. So their immune system function, we're just going to kind of say this is what they do. And our next chapter we'll go over is the immune system. So when we talk about immune system in this chapter, it's going to be kind of a vague this is kind of how it does, helps our immune system. What does our immune system do for us? Fight off infections. Your immune system prevents anything that is not supposed to be in your body from hurting you. Okay? Uh, that can be as far as something as simple as you have inhaled a bunch of dirt, a bunch of dust, and it got past your nose hair. You, your body has to get it out. That actually is also part of your immune system getting it out. But if you inhale bacteria or something like that, your immune system has to kill it and then get it out. So that's, that we'll do in the next chapter. This is just going to be real vague when we talk about immune system. Okay? Your lymphatic system is a one-way set of tubes. How is that different from your blood vessel, your cardiovascular? Cardiovascular is two-way, right? It was a closed system. Your blood does not leave your blood vessel unless something's wrong. All right? Your blood stayed in your blood vessel in one direction, then came back up in the opposite direction. Right? Lymphatic system is not like that. Your lymphatic system has a start, a beginning, and it has an end. Your lymphatic system begins down in the area of your capillary beds. Okay? In your capillary beds, Mixed in with all those little tiny blood vessel capillaries, you have teeny tiny little lymphatic capillaries. Okay? The word capillary just tells us that these are the smallest lymphatic vessels. Okay? Lymphatic capillaries get larger, become lymphatic vessels, then get bigger and become lymphatic trunks and ducts. And we're going to look at that in just a minute. We're going to start down here in the capillary. Okay? Other than this, we need to understand that when we say the word lymph, we're talking about the actual fluid that's flowing through the lymphatic vessels. Makes sense, right? Blood vessels have blood in them. Lymphatic vessels have lymph. Okay? Now, where, what is in your lymph? Your lymph is mainly just water because the overall job of the lymphatic system is to get excess water out of the portions of your body. Where does all that water come from? that your lymphatic capillaries are sucking out? Around the cells. How did it get around the cells? What did your cells do to make water? Anytime your cell makes energy, water is made as a byproduct. And we don't want to swell up, so we've got these vessels to suck up any extra water that's out there. Okay? Doesn't come from drinking or anything like that. That goes a completely different route. All right? Along the way, through these vessels, we have little swollen areas that we call lymph nodes. Okay? You don't just have lymph nodes here in your neck. You have them throughout your body in your lymphatic vessels. They serve as the primary immune system part of your lymphatic system. Their job is to check the lymphatic fluid, the lymph, flowing through there and make sure there's nothing in it that's not supposed to be. Okay? So we're going to talk more about lymph nodes when we get there. All right? All the other lymphoid organs we're going to talk about, they are just the structure where all of your immune system cells live. So what we're going to do with them is we're going to say, okay, here's the generic structure they all have. Here's what's in them. And how are they different? How are they similar? But real, real vague with those lymphoid organs. Okay? So how do the lymphatic capillaries work? They are open at the bottom. But it should make sense to you. It can't just be a giant open tube. If it was just a giant open tube, there'd be nothing to make the water want to go in them, right? Because there's nothing pumping or sucking at the top of those tubes. So it can't just be open. 
then nothing would ever go in there. They're open in the sense that they have little slits in the wall of the capillary. Those slits have little flaps that come down over the top. Okay? And they almost they work by something called capillary action. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever seen a capillary tube before or not, but have any of you ever seen those teeny tiny little glass tubes? If you touch them to water, water will automatically suck into the tube. If you've ever seen them, you know what I'm talking about. The reason the water sucks into the tube is um, the, side, the water is attracted to the side of the glass. And as the water is attracted, it slowly will start moving up the tube without anything having to pull it up, just because of the chemical attraction between the water and the tube. And it's similar to that. If there's a drop of water near this little flap, it's such a small opening that the water is attracted to it and will slowly start to leak in there. So we're not talking about massive flow of water like a river flows. It's slowly leaking in, and then once enough of it gets in there, a little more will push it further and further and further. Does that make sense? Okay. Let me try to give you, if you've never seen capillary tube, let me try to give you something else visual. Okay. When I first get hot and start to get ready to sweat, do I immediately have beads of sweat running down my face? No. What happens first? You have a little bit of water that forms on your forehead, right? What makes it turn into a bead of sweat? More and more of the water kind of starts hanging out together, right? And when it gets heavy enough, it falls as a bead of sweat, right? As more and more water collects around this area, it eventually gets to a point that it starts to suck into the area. And the more water is made, the more that's going to suck into there. Okay? Now you have these almost everywhere in the body. The only place you do not have them is in your central nervous system. Okay? The reason you don't have them there is because you don't want to suck fluid out of your central nervous system. There's a very important fluid that flows through there. What's it called? Cerebrospinal fluid, right? CSF. If you had lymphatic vessels there, you would suck fluid out of that, and it's very, very bad if the balance of the water in there get, goes off. Okay. Other places you don't have them are in your teeth, and just simply because you don't need them there. You don't make energy in your teeth. And the other places in your bone marrow, which we'll understand a little bit more when we do Chapter 21. Now. Just to make a note, and just kind of make a note and file it a little further back in your brain. You don't need it just yet, but we're going to talk about it later. There's a very special type of lymphatic capillary called a lacteal. And when we get to the digestive system, I'm going to talk about lacteals. Okay? They are found only in the wall of your small intestine. They're just to give you a preview what's going to happen. When we get to the digestive system, we're going to talk about how things are moving from the inside of your intestines into your blood so you can use it. Well, your fat can't go directly into your blood. Your fat takes a side route. Your fat goes through your lacteals. So when I say that, you need to have it in your mind, oh, okay, that means it's going through my lymphatic system. But ultimately, our lymphatic system is going to make it to our blood. So you're going to see this word. I think it's chapter 25 or so. So just to Somewhere in the back of your mind, keep that there. All right. So our water has made it into our lymphatic capillary. How does it get further than that? You know, where does it go? Okay. Well, it eventually goes from your capillaries into larger and larger vessels. Once it leaves and it's no longer in the capillary bed, we just call it a lymphatic vessel. When it gets big enough that several large vessels are connecting together, we call it a trunk. And you have just five, yeah, five trunks. Okay? You have a lumbar lymphatic trunk. So where's that one going to be? Around your lower back region. Okay? And you'll see, I'm going to flip to a picture in a second, we've got a pretty large one that runs up the center of the body, and that lumbar trunk dumps into there. The bronchomediastinal, where's that one going to be? In your chest, near your lungs and your mediastinum. Subclavian, around your collarbone, right? Jugular, in your neck, and the intestinal, from your intestine. That's where those lacteals are going to, that are absorbing fats for you dump into. Trunks join together and become a duct. It is only considered a duct when it's entering the blood, okay? Because all of your lymph eventually goes to the blood. 
Okay? If we're collecting extra water, the only way we can get it out of our body is to pee it out. And we'll learn later on in chapters when we talk about urine, the way you get rid of your water is you filter it out of your blood. So this lymphatic fluid, this limb's got to go to the blood, so eventually it can be turned into urine. Okay? You have a couple, in, only two important ducts. You have the right lymphatic duct and the thoracic duct. Your right lymphatic duct drains the right side of the body, just the upper portion. So all the lymphatic vessels in this portion of my body eventually drain into that right lymphatic duct. Everything else, all the rest of my body, the lower half and this left side, drains through my thoracic duct. They both drain into your subclavian veins. So which subclavian vein do you think your right lymphatic duct is going to drain into? Your right subclavian vein. The thoracic duct is going to drain into your left subclavian vein. Your subclavian veins from chapter 19, where do they drain into? How do they get to the heart? Through the superior vena cava. So we're dumping all of this fluid right into the entryway of our heart so that we can immediately mix it with our blood, give it some good pressure, pump it back out so we can get it to our kidneys, turn it into urine. Okay? So that's the pathway. How does it go? Right? There's nothing making it go except the fact that as you have more and more water together, it'll push it into the capillaries. Well, if it goes into a capillary in my calf, What's going to make it come all the way up my leg, all the way up into this thoracic duct right here? More water helps it move, but you've got to have something to push it. Simply your body movement is the only thing you have to move your limbs. Every time I move my leg and my skeletal muscle contracts, that skeletal muscle squeezes that lymphatic vessel and pushes the water up. Well, when my muscle relaxes, what keeps it from going back down? You have little valves in your lymphatic capillaries, in your lymphatic vessels, just like we did with veins, right? Remember, our veins were lower pressure, right? So we had little valves to catch the blood where it couldn't go backwards. You have little valves in your lymphatic vessels. So after you finally get the water pushed up, it'll hit that valve and it can't go any further down. And then when you squeeze that next muscle moving around, it'll move a little further up and another valve will catch it, okay? So... Last week when we were introducing this, I asked you guys the question, if you're laid up in a hospital bed, why does the nurse come move you or make you get up and walk? So you won't swell, right? Because them coming and moving you moves your muscles, squeezes those lymphatic vessels, and pushes that water into your blood. You can lay down and your heart will pump your blood for you, but you have to physically move your body to move your lymph. And once... That's what the pumps on the feet are for. How many of you ever slept in a hospital bed? Did you sleep good? No, because what's that stupid thing doing? The bed blows up with air in certain places and then goes back down. A portion of that is to stimulate different muscles in your body. I can remember I slept on the couch bed the night after I had my child because that bed was the most uncomfortable thing. You found, you're trying to sleep in a stupid bed, wouldn't quit moving. I wouldn't sleep on the little fold-out couch with my husband. I couldn't stand it. But that's why those beds do that, is to try to move your body. Okay? All right. Mm-hmm. It was just one little place was swollen. That she had a buildup in her lymphatic system. That's what the localized swelling was. But a lot of times that's from an infection that has blocked your lymph. Your lymph. A real common one is, um, you guys have seen pictures of people with elephantiasis, right? That's a worm. that in, it's, a, it's, a, it's called filariasis. It's a worm that gets into your lymphatic system and blocks it. And so all of that fluid is just natural fluid in your body that builds up and it can't go anywhere. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It would have helped if she would have moved more, but once 
you get to a certain point in your cancer. What are we always scared of? That cancer is going to get into the, the lymph, right? In your lymph nodes. That means if it gets in your lymph nodes, it is going to eventually make it to your blood and go everywhere in your body, right? It can metastasize. But the other reason when people get that swelling when they have cancer is because they have such large numbers of cancer cells that it's blocking their lymphatic system. Okay? Good. So see, this is real life stuff we're talking about. All right. So here's our pictures. Now this is supposed to give you a generic idea of kind of what your lymphatic system looks like in your body. But this is not a, a very good picture because you see how big pieces have nothing? There's nowhere out here in your body that doesn't have any lymphatic vessels. What I figure is when they drew this picture, they were just trying to show you some of the major ones. I don't want you to learn you're not going to learn names of lymphatic vessels. That's just crazy to make you learn. And as far as finding the trunks, well, you know, if I point to one right here, this is lumbar, right? If I point to one up here, it's going to be in this region. It's bronchomediastinal, okay? So you don't really have to learn those. But what I'd like you to notice is, you see all the little circles? What do you think those are? Those are lymph nodes. You have them all through here, okay? Now, where do you have the most lymph nodes? They are concentrated in your neck. Those are your cervical lymph nodes. But the other concentrated areas that are just as concentrated as your neck are your armpits. That's axillary lymph nodes. And the other one would be the inguinal lymph nodes. Those are in the groin region. Okay? Um, when you're sick, a lot of times you like to feel in your neck and say, oh, I'm sick, my lymph nodes are swollen. We're going to talk about why in just a second. But I can remember when I was nursing, I had a bunch of blocked lymph nodes, axillary lymph nodes, and they were swollen. It was really, really painful, and that's because when the baby doesn't use all of the milk, it's got to go drain somewhere, and it actually begins to drain back through the lymphatic system. So that's why a woman's axillary lymph nodes will swell, along, of course, with breasts and everything else. When a baby goes to the doctor, they take the diaper off and they push right at the crease of the leg and the hip. They're feeling for swollen inguinal nodes because in a baby, the inguinal nodes are larger than the cervical, so they'll typically swell before the inguinal will. Okay? That's if that means they're sick. That means they have an infection and that their body's fighting it off. Okay? So just to show you, where the, the two things I would expect you to really be able to identify are your two major ducts. Okay, the trunks, yeah, there's a lot of them, but the ducts, there's only two. So here's my right subclavian vein, right, draining into my superior vena cava. There's only one place where my lymphatic system drains into this right subclavian vein. That is my right lymphatic duct. Okay, here's my left subclavian vein. There's only one thing that drains into the left, and what was that one called? Thoracic duct. Very good. Okay, I don't guess it's labeled on here, but that's the thoracic duct. It comes all the way up, drains down here. Okay? Now, it's kind of hard to see in this picture. Let me dim the lights. But that guy is shaded two different colors. Can you guys tell that? See how the kind of left side of his body is kind of a pinky color and the right side of his body is kind of green? This shows you what is drained by each one. So just the right arm, the right side of the abdomen, and the right side of the head go into the right lymphatic duct. All of the lower half of the body and the left arm and the left side of the head go into the thoracic duct. That's why the thoracic duct is bigger than the right lymphatic duct. But they both do the same thing. Okay? Make sense? All right. So now we're ready to get to the point to look at these organs and some tissues. But before we do that, I need to give you the name of a few cells that we're going to see as we go through. We're going to see the word lymphocytes. Now, we're going to spend an entire chapter talking about what lymphocytes do. But does anybody remember, we've already said the word lymphocyte. When did we say that? It's one of your five types of white blood cells. Okay? And at that time, I said, okay, these are your T cells and B cells. We'll talk about them later. Okay, well, we're still not quite ready to talk about them. We'll talk about them a little bit more. Your T cells and B cells are your specific part of your immune system. They actually look at different things coming in your body and they say, oh wait, this is the flu virus and I'm going to attack it and destroy it. They specifically look for stuff and can kill it. Okay, we'll talk about how next chapter. Other things you'll see as we look through all these organs, you're going to see macrophages 
and reticular cells. Macrophages are your phagocytic cells. What does phagocytosis mean? Engulf or eat other cells. Okay. Do you remember where macrophages come from? They come out of the blood. Monocytes turn into macrophages. Remember, monocyte was one of your other five types of white blood cells, right? Once that monocyte leaves the blood, it goes to these lymphatic tissues. And it, be, it changes, and we start calling it a macrophage. It starts eating other stuff. It gets bigger. We give it a bigger name. Okay? Reticular cells are little fibroblast cells. So let's challenge of the day. Who remembers what a fibroblast is? Remember we talked about tissues, chapter 4. Mm -hmm. Every connective tissue that is just plain connective tissue, has a cell in it called a fibroblast. Its job is to make the matrix of the connective tissue. All of our lymphoid organs are going to be made of reticular tissue. Okay? So those fibroblast cells are making the matrix of the connective tissue itself. Okay? These are actually very simple organs. They've got three things in them. They've got a cell that's making the organ. That's your fibroblast-like cells, okay, your reticular cells. They're making the organ. Then you've got macrophages and lymphocytes. They're in the organ, killing stuff that's coming into it. That's actually a very simple organ for your body. If you compare it to think about what you had to learn with the brain, right? Nowhere near as complex. Okay? Once these three types of cells start working together, it becomes lymphatic tissue. Remember, you have a group of cells working together becomes a tissue, right? Then a group of tissues working together becomes a what? An organ. So for it to be a lymphoid tissue, it's going to have all three types of those cells in there, and they are going to be spread through your body providing surveillance points. And I know that's a, kind of a silly way of saying it, but you all know what that means, right? If we set up surveillance around campus, what does that mean? We're watching different sites in the area, we're watching for stuff to happen. So this is spread throughout your body, everywhere in your body, constantly looking for anything that is coming to invade you that's not supposed to be there. Okay? Sometimes it's just diffuse lymphoid tissue in other organs, okay? just hanging out. Sometimes it's found in a follicle, and that's what we're about to look at as we look at these cells, I mean these organs, excuse me. Okay, so lymphoid follicle is just a little bit more organized. So is everybody with me? These are the type of cells that are going to work together to make these tissues, and now we're going to look at the organs that these tissues are found in. We good? Because it seems kind of silly the way we go through it. All right. So the most important lymphatic organ we need to go over is a lymph node. And I've already showed you, they're found throughout the lymphatic vessels, mainly organized in the neck, armpit, and groin, but found throughout. There's two parts to a lymph node. There's the filtration function of a lymph node and the immune system function of the lymph node. Okay? The filtration function is probably the easiest to understand. If I have a filter, right, it is a bunch of fibers kind of crisscrossed together, right, and there's little holes in it. The bigger the hole is, more stuff can pass through it, right? Smaller the hole, I'm going to catch stuff. So as your lymphatic fluid, your lymph, is flowing through your lymph node, it's a filter. It's a whole bunch of fibers stuck together. Anything that's too big is going to get trapped in your lymph node. Only the fluid is going to continue. Why do we want to catch anything that's not fluid in your lymph? Is this dumping into your blood, right? Do you want anything that's not fluid to dump into your blood? Of course not, right? So we've got to have a way of catching stuff. Well, what do we do with it once we catch it? We've got to have a way of killing it, all right? The way we kill it is the immune system function of your lymph nodes. In your lymph node, you have those cells that we were talking about. You have lymphocytes. You have macrophages. So if my lymph node has trapped a bacteria, my macrophage is going to eat it. And we'll talk about exactly what that means in the next chapter. But if my macrophage eats that bacteria that I've trapped, it can kill it 
and turn it into teeny tiny little pieces that won't hurt me anymore. They'll filter on through and they continue until I get rid of them. Okay? If it is a bacteria, not only will my macrophages eat it, my T cells and B cells will look at it and say, oh, I know, okay, now we know what this looks like. If it comes again, we're ready. And we'll talk a little bit more about that next chapter. But all of them are working together just to make sure if it's foreign, if it's bacteria, viral, anything like that, they're going to kill it. Cancer cells are the same way. Okay? Most people hear the word cancer and they think tumor. That's not what cancer means. Cancer just means abnormal cell. You have abnormal cells all the time in your body. The reason you don't get cancer is because things like this destroy that one abnormal cell. Somebody that gets cancer, your immune system missed it, and your abnormal cell started dividing really rapidly, and your immune system just couldn't kill it. Okay? So here's what our lymph node looks like. Okay? Kind of has this kidney bean structure to it. You have a whole bunch of stuff going in on this side. These are the afferent vessels. A meaning goes in. The fluid comes out through usually one or two efferent vessels. And the way I can always remember that is A comes before E. So the afferent's going in, the efferent's exiting, going out. Okay? So you can kind of look at this and see how this looks like a filter. It's made of reticular connective tissue. So you have all these reticular fibers crisscrossing through it, catching stuff. So if I have some fluid, it comes in through here. See, here's one of these valves, so it can't go the other way. I only want it coming one way, right? So my fluid comes in, and it flows through all of these fibers that is just working to catch something as it goes through. All of these little purple things, these are cells. Do you see how the cells kind of organize into a almost circular shape? Can you guys see that? These circular shapes, that is a lymphoid follicle. That's your lymphatic tissue inside of your lymph node. So as something flows in through here, if it's bacteria, it'll get trapped by all these little reticular fibers, and then all of these cells start immediately trying to kill whatever got trapped in there. Okay? If they make it past this one, there's some more. Something else is going to catch it. Okay? As we look at this, we need to kind of see the generic structure because we're going to see this. Every one of these organs has the same generic structure. They're going to have, usually have afferent and efferent. It's going to have a one-way flow. Okay? Wrapped around the outside is going to be the capsule. The capsule is very, very tough. Okay? If the capsule dips down in forming little compartments, these little indentions are called trabeculae. Okay? Anytime you see a collection of the little cells like this, it's called a follicle. Outside, where the follicles are real organized, that's called the cortex. So what do you think the inside is called? The medulla. Okay? So you're going to see that same thing on all of these. You're going to see a capsule. The capsule may invaginate. That's called trabeculae. Circular areas where your lymphoid cells are, those are called follicles. Outer edge is the cortex. Inside the medulla. Pretty easy, right? That's the same anatomy is going to come up with each of them. Does that make sense? So now do you understand why your lymph nodes may swell when you're sick? What are they doing? They're fighting whatever's making you sick. If you've got a bacterial infection, that lymph node that is swollen is full of bacteria. And your little cells are trying to kill it and eat whatever's in there and destroy it. Okay? So is it necessarily bad for your lymph node to swell? Not really. It would actually be a whole lot worse if your lymph nodes never swell because that means they're not doing anything. If they swell up, that means, yeah, you caught something, but at least your body's trying to kill it. What it would become bad is if it swells and never goes away. Okay? Is that possible? Can your lymph node get blocked? Yes, your lymph nodes can become too infected your immune system can't handle it, and they, they can go in and remove lymph nodes. Um, I may have told you guys this story. I can't remember. I told in one of my classes. I remember my sister had one taken out of her armpit when we were little kids. And it was, you know, I mean, they, they cut her open pretty good and had to sew her up when they took the lymph node out. So she couldn't wear deodorant for a little while while her little sore, while her wound was healing. And I made fun of her and told her she stunk all the time because she couldn't wear deodorant. 
So then that was just me being mean. Um, make sense? Go ahead. Well, they will try, but um, tularitis, the elephantiasis, is not curable at all. They'll give you medication, but it doesn't kill all of them. And eventually, one day, the population of the little worm will get so concentrated that they can't do anything about it. It's fed by a mosquito bite in other countries, not in here. You can't really, you can't get elephantiasis. You can't get tularitis in the United States. A lot of people that have it are military that fought in like Vietnam. And they didn't know they had it then, but now that they're back here, it's starting to show up. The worms have had time to grow. It's a really cool disease if you ever want to read something interesting. Obviously, you can tell I think it's neat. I've obviously read about it, but I do at least teach that sort of. Did you, did you say? Uh-uh, we have different mosquitoes here. Because mosquito species can only, can only carry really specific infections. But as climate changes circulate, now I don't really believe in global warming. I think that's a scare tactic. But we do have cycles of temperature. And right now we're on the upslope of it's getting warmer and warmer here. And so more different species of mosquitoes are coming here. That's why we started seeing cases of malaria in the United States. Because different mosquitoes that carry malaria can live here now. Xenopheles is his name. But they're big mega mosquitoes. Y'all think our mosquitoes look mean? You go to like Africa or deep South America, dude, their mosquitoes are scary. They look like mosquito hawks. And we all know mosquito hawks are good, right? They have big mosquitoes that bite. Uh, a lot of times, I can remember being a kid, this little girl found out she had cancer. And the way she figured it out is she felt a knot in her neck that wouldn't go away. And that was, it had cancer in it. It was infected. Okay, so that a lot of times you'll see that. Now, if you get a swollen lymph node, do you need to immediately go to the doctor? No, because you live in South Mississippi. Most of us have allergies. Your allergies can, inf can flame up your lymph nodes for no reason. Okay? But I know everybody gets kind of scared. I've had, we've all had probably that weird lymph node. I can remember I had one behind my ear one time that swole. And just because that was a weird one to swell, you start thinking something's really wrong with you. But as long as it goes away in a day or two, you're fine. Okay? All right. That is, that's the majority of the important lymphoid organs. All of these others, their job is, to do, their main job in our body is something else. But they just have some lymphatic tissue in them. Okay? And the one that is really kind of exemplifies that is the spleen. Okay? Your spleen is located over in the left side of your body, kind of wraps around your stomach. And we're about to the point in lab where we're going to start dissecting our little pigs. And you're going to see how all of these organs hang out together. Okay? The spleen is not attached to the stomach, which it looks like in pictures, but that's where it's located. Your spleen's main job in your body is to take care of red blood cells that have gotten old and they're not good anymore. So your spleen recycles all of that. So you can constantly make new red blood cells. That's what your spleen is really there for. In addition to that, your spleen is also a surveillance point. It has little follicles in it that contain lymphatic organ excuse me, lymphatic cells like lymphocytes and macrophages. So if blood comes through there, that contains something that it needs to destroy, that surveillance point will become activated. And your immune system is amazing. We'll talk about next chapter. Once one lymphatic cell, once one B cell, or one T cell in your body, one macrophage, finds a bacteria, it sends out signals and tells every other cell in your body that the, it found something. Okay? So that's the only reason that the spleen is even in this chapter. In lab, we're going to look at the spleen and the tonsil and all these others under the microscope. I know y'all love that. But when we look at them under the microscope, you'll see the spleen also has a capsule. It has trabeculae. It has follicles. It has a cortex. It has a medulla. So you see that recurring structure that we learned in the lymph node. We're just only going to worry about the lymph node structure in class. Okay? Your thymus. Your thymus is located right in the center of your thorax. Your thymus is shriveled up and pretty pitiful looking. 
because you're all adults. Your thymus is only large when you are a baby. Okay? I'll be able to show you the thymus really well in lab when we dissect pigs because they're fetal pigs. They're babies. So their thymus is still huge. Your thymus is main job in your body. That's where your T cells develop. So if our T cells are going to be an important lymphatic cell, then if they're born in the thymus, obviously we have to consider this as part of the lymphatic system, even though it's not even really a surveillance point. It's just where your T cells grow. The reason your thymus is old and shriveled up is because you've already made most of the T cells you're going to make in your body. They've been challenged, and they're just there to help you now. You're not really making any more of them. Okay? Now, MALT is a, it's an acronym for Mucosal Associated, that's just have a D on it, the picture's covering it up, Mucosal Associated Lymphoid Tissues. This is a collection of lymphoid tissue. It's not an organized enough collection of tissue that we really consider them organs. Like we consider the spleen and the thymus an organ. Malt is really just tissues. We have malt. We have this organization of tissues anywhere that has a mucosal membrane. Your mucosal membranes are through your nasal cavity, through your mouth, down your esophagus into your stomach, your intestines, until it comes out of your body. That's considered that digestive tract plus your nose. That's where you have mucous membranes. Okay? So the, where you have tissues along the way that are considered part of malt are your tonsils, located all around the opening of your oral and nasal mucosa, your nose and your mouth. Okay? Other places you have what we call pyres patches throughout your intestines. And then we have a specialized one called the appendix. Okay? And I know we haven't done digestive yet, but if you follow this track, it goes esophagus, stomach, through all of this small intestine. That's where your pyres patches are. And then it comes out into the large intestine. So this is where the large intestine starts. And that's the appendix hanging off of the large intestine. And then our poo comes up, over, down, and out. Okay? So if we talk about each one of these, I didn't put any pictures up here because I didn't want you thinking you had to learn structures. That's why they're not in your PowerPoint. Okay? Tonsils, where are your tonsils at? How many do you think you have? You have six. Okay? You have two in the back of the throat. Those are called your palatine tonsils. Those are the most common ones that are removed. How many of you had your tonsils removed when you were a kid? A lot of you did. That means that you guys are probably close to my age because that was a big thing when we were kids was to, your kid's sick again, oh, let's take them tonsils out. We don't think they need them. Now we've kind of decided, you know, we probably do need them so they don't take kids' tonsils out quite as fast as they used to. If you're like me and you still have your tonsils and you're close to 30, well, I'm 31, but you're close to 30, um, when you open your mouth and stick out your tongue and say, ah, two things from the side in the very back of your throat will kind of come out a little bit, that's your palatine tonsils. So go home and look at your palatine tonsils if you still have them. Okay? When I get sick and go to the doctor and they tell me, say, ah, they always look at me and say, my God, your tonsils are huge because they've been growing them for 31 years. So if you still have those tonsils, you will see them. They're big. They poke out back there. The other sets you can't see. Your lingual tonsils are deep down in your throat at the very back base of your tongue. I don't know if anybody ever really has those lingual tonsils removed. You'd have to be really, really sick for a very long time for them to take those out. The pharyngeal tonsils are all the way in the back of your nose at the start of your pharynx, which is your throat. It starts at the back of your nose. We don't most people don't call them pharyngeal tonsils. They call them adenoids. Okay? But your adenoids are just a set of tonsils. The others are, honestly, when I first take, took AMP, I never learned that there were tubal tonsils. But they have now considered there's an organized enough patch of tissue in your ear canal that they call them tubal tonsils. But I think those are kind of iffy. But the first three, What's the job of those tonsils? What do you think they do? 
Catch bacteria that comes in through where? Your nose or your mouth. So if it's in your food and you start chewing it up and there's some bacteria in it, the first thing that's going to try to catch that is your palatine and then your lingual. If you're breathing in air that has bacteria in it, or even dust, if you're allergic to dust, anything like that, your pharyngeal, your adenoids are going to be the first ones to catch it. Okay? So why do you think doctors have now decided, you know, we probably shouldn't take these out unless we absolutely have to? They help catch stuff that's in the air in your food. Okay? Most people I know that had their tonsils removed when they are a kid, they get sinus infections three and four times more often than someone that does not. Well, that's because you're breathing the same air that I'm breathing, and my tonsils may swell up and catch what I'm breathing, but if you don't have tonsils, it's going straight past your tonsils and further into your body before your immune system can attempt to kill it. Go ahead. Constant infection of the tonsils is all it is. And it's kind of the same way with a lymph node. We talked about it can get to the point where you have an infection in your tonsils that they're having a hard time getting rid of. A lot of times people that get recurrent strep throat, the, the strep, the bacteria Streptococcus pyogenes is living in the tonsil. And that's why they say this person's constantly getting strep throat. It just depends on the person whether they can cure it or not. Yeah, but pharyngitis is technically a swelling of the lining of the pharynx, not necessarily the tonsil. That's the difference between pharyngitis and tonsillitis. But yeah, it's still coming the same, same way. They just can't take your pharynx out like they could take your tonsils out. It's your only real difference. That means it's housed in the wall of your throat and not just your tonsils. So you're just really lucky. Not really. There's some people that, um, it's not going to do anything. At the age that we are in this classroom, having your tonsils out is really not going to do much for a recurrent infection because by now, if it's been living in your tonsils, it's living in your throat. A lot of people have their adenoids out as adults. Why? Not just for infection reasons, why else? Because they snore. As, as you get older, your adenoids are supposed to resorb. They completely shrivel up. And people that snore super loud and have their adenoids removed, it's because theirs didn't shrivel up like they were supposed to. So as they breathe through their nose at night, their adenoids are back there flapping. And the, when, you're a kid, when you're a baby, the little hole is smaller, so air is not blowing through as fast. As your nose gets bigger, as you grow into an adult, if those adenoids are back there, as you breathe more air, they're flapping. And if you ever slept with somebody that snores, I don't tell him I said it, but I sleep with somebody that snores every night, you can hear you can hear that rattle. And sometimes that rattle is the adenoid. Sometimes it's their tongue or if they're sleeping with their mouth open. But if they have their mouth closed and you still hear that rattle, it's those adenoids slapping in the wind. All right. Uh, <laughs> Pyres patches are just little patches of lymphatic tissue throughout your small intestine. And there's a lot of controversy over exactly how they work because your intestine is full of bacteria. Okay? That's actually what your appendix does. Okay? Your appendix is a little breeding ground for good bacteria. So it's kind of controversial over how do your pyres patches and your appendix know when is it good, when is it bad. There's actually a lot of research going on with that. But their job is to say, okay, this is, let's help make the good bacteria grow. Well, this is a bad bacteria. Let's kill him. He's not supposed to be here. So, I mean, that right there you should be able to think, well, that's probably pretty hard for it to tell. But somehow it knows this is good, this is bad. It's much worse for you to have too little bacteria in your intestine than too much bacteria in your intestine. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's and that's one of your most common signs of Crohn's disease is that imbalance of bacteria and constant swelling and that's where they get a lot of their pain and discomfort from is the swelling 
in their intestines. So why, why do we freak out when the appendix ruptures? What's it full of? Bacteria, right? So here it is. It's normally a little small thing that's got some bacteria in it. When it starts swelling and it starts hurting, the bacteria is multiplying, multiplying, multiplying. If it ruptures, that's such a big deal because now we have just spread millions of bacteria into the inside of your body. That's pretty hard to take care of. That's pretty hard to fix. That's why if it starts swelling, they got to take it out. So that's another one of those, should we just take out something? You know, most of these things, we got them for a reason. Well, yeah, you can take them out and you can live perfectly fine because everything you eat has bacteria in it. And your good bacteria is in much higher concentrations than your bad bacteria everywhere. So I, if I eat anything, it's going to have some of the poop bacteria on it. That's just a fact of life. Poop bacteria is everywhere. So I'm going to ingest what I need, and it'll hang out. Most of those bacteria that live in our intestine have little structures sticking off of them that look like porcupine quills, and they stick into the wall of our intestine so they don't come out with our poo. The other stuff just comes right out. It's nice to think about, right? Okay. So that's it with the lymphatic system. See, I hope you can see what I mean by it's kind of a vague system. What you really need to understand from this is structurally, how are all of those vessels organized? As far as structure of organ lymph nodes, the only one you got to worry about. And then I just want you to have an idea of what the lymph nodes do and kind of a generic idea of how all those other organs function in our lymphatic system. Okay? Your next exam will cover 18, 19, and 20. Majority of your test will come from chapter 18, which is the heart. Okay, so as you study, you should focus your attention on the heart, then blood vessels, then lymphatic system. Okay, so I'm just trying to give you a heads up on how to study.